Good evening and welcome to all of you uh, to this uh, opening of the, of the spring semester season of Sunday at the Abbey. It's truly my pleasure to welcome Brother Dennis Beach um, to, this, to give this presentation uh, entitled Faith is a Transformative Force in El Salvador. Brother Dennis came to St. John's as an undergraduate from Chicago, did his work in English, graduating uh, with a degree in English in 1978. After some teaching, he entered the monastery and made first vows in 1982. While doing teaching administration at PrEP, Dennis did coursework at St. John's program in great books and liberal studies in Santa Fe. And in 1991, he went to Penn State to begin his doctoral work uh, in philosophy and co completed that in some period of time after that. Huh? 97. 97? 97. Dennis has focused on modern and contemporary continental philosophy, anywhere from Kant and Hegel, Nietzsche to Heidegger, Levinas, Derrida, Foucault, but also the Greeks, Plato and Aristotle. All the way through that time, Dennis has been involved in social justice issues. He chaired the Peace and Justice Committee for the Abbey over many, many years, uh, took care of the uh, Fair Trade Coffee Program, but also has been involved uh, in working directly with Latinos who need help in terms of uh, working on their legal status, et cetera. He has uh, been in involved and, and caring about both the theoretical and the practical side of social justice issues. And as part of that energy and, and effort, uh, went to, to El Salvador uh, many, many times. I want to say at least 20, maybe? Yeah, 20 times. That's a lot of trips, uh, especially as part of the a sister city project with St. Cloud. He also, uh, he's an avid cyclist in the warmer time of the year and a very fine cook. I'm especially pleased, Dennis, that you took time in the middle of a very heavy and busy schedule at this time to put this presentation together. Please give a warm Collegeville welcome to Brother Dennis Beach. I'm hoping that this uh, portable microphone is working. It sounds like it's working. Um, this is not, if you follow the news, this is not the volcano that's been exploding in El Salvador since about the 28th of December. This one is called Chinchon Tepec, or San Vicente. They always have, almost always have indigenous names plus a local name. Last summer, Abbot John asked me if I could do a talk on El Salvador today and I told him I could probably more easily do a talk on El Salvador yesterday. Um, but a couple of things have come. To, I remembered one thing and another thing happened in the interim that will allow me to speak of today. But my focus is going to be on something that seems to be as true of people's experiences in visiting El Salvador starting in the 1980s during their civil war through the 1990s initial recovery period and still today. Um, this is the current U.S. State Department travel warning for U.S. citizens thinking about going to El Salvador, and it's rather dire. Uh, crime and violence levels in El Salvador remain critically high, and this warning uh, supersedes the warning issued not even seven months earlier, which was also pretty dire, but apparently not dire enough to dissuade tens of thousands of annual U.S. visitors to El Salvador. Now Costa Rica and Guatemala and Panama and other countries there have many more. Costa Rica's well into the millions, I think somewhere in about two million. Um, I'm not sure if they're all U.S. citizens, but it's far more. But you can be sure that that January 2013 warning replaced an earlier one that was also dire, and that replaced an earlier one, and so on, but still tens of thousands make their way. And why do they ignore these warnings, you wonder? Why do tens of thousands of people travel to a country where they are as likely as not, apart from having anxiety about security, to have their sleep, especially in the countryside where almost all of them go, to have their sleep interrupted by roosters and dogs who seem to take turns waking each other up all night, um, to have to use latrines instead of toilets, especially in the country, uh, and perhaps to experience traveler sickness that can affect, 
well, let's just say both ends of the digestive tract. Well, one reason seems at least to me to be indicated by the fact that this U.S. State Department uh, warning, uh, and in fact, if we would read down, it gives the reasons they travel there, ignores one of the prominent groups that travel. The people, the largest group that I know that travel to El Salvador are not simply tourists, though some of them target some specific big surf beaches. They're not generally students in formal study abroad programs, although they might be students on short-term trips, uh, one week or 10-day trips, two-week trips. Um, nor is the largest demographic people traveling on business or, strictly speaking, volunteers, so there are some of those. Instead, they are pilgrims, members of solidarity groups, overwhelmingly religious solidarity groups, and they often travel to visit specific sister or partner communities or to take part in anniversary commemorations and celebrations of the martyrs of El Salvador. Now, not many countries try to market themselves with martyr tourism. Um, but El Salvador, in some ways, has that without marketing it. This is probably the most famous martyr of El Salvador. And I'm guessing that most people here, if not everyone, will recognize this as Archbishop Oscar Anulfo Romero, assassinated on March 24, 1980 after three years as Archbishop of El Salvador. And these are probably also recognizable to many, but not all. These are the four, what they're called in El Salvador is the, well, in Spanish, but the North American church women. Uh, the top two are Mary Knoll sisters, were Mary Knoll sisters, Ita Ford and Maura Clark. Uh, and then Dorothy Cazell is the bottom left, uh, Ursuline sister, all of them from uh, our, the Cleveland area. And then Jean Donovan was a lay missionary, recent college grad, who had volunteered with them. They were killed in December of 1980, December 2nd, so about eight and a half months after Romero. We get to these, and these, they have names on them. And these are also, for people that followed things, somewhat well known. The sixth around the kind of horseshoe, starting on the side around the top, are the Jesuits who were killed at the University of Central America November 16th, 1989, so nine years later, near the end of the war. And almost all the lists of people, prominent people, church people you see killed were before 1983. And so things had kind of settled down. There were peace talks going on. But then in 1989, uh, late November, this happened. The six of them were killed at night. And the two women, uh, the older, uh, the mother, Alba Ramos, Alba Julia Ramos, was uh, their cook, and so she was staying in the, she got up early to cook for them. Um, and her daughter was staying with her because they thought it was safer with all these armed forces around the compound to stay with her rather than stay at her home. And they were killed too in their, uh, actually the bedroom where they stayed. The Jesuits were in the other part of the building. But these are also martyrs of El Salvador from the same time period. Most of these are from were killed before Romero, except for the young woman on the left, who was a um, Salvadoran woman religious. The others were Americans, or North America, all United States. Um, Sylvia, I had another slide that I cut with her. She shows up, her face shows up on murals uh, on buildings in El Salvador in the countryside a lot. Um, the most notable of these is the uh, person who's closest to the top, uh, uh, just a little to the right, uh, Rutilio Grande was a Jesuit, a good friend of uh, Monsignor Romero. Um, and he's the one who was killed with his, the sacristan and the altar boy at the beginning of the movie Romero, if you saw that. And his death, not even two months into Romero's uh, term as archbishop, really sort of galvanized and, and changed the consciousness of uh, Archbishop Romero. And we have yet more. All of these, except for the woman, of course, are either priests or one is a sacristan. She it was a human rights worker, um, the official El Salvador human rights director. She was the last one killed of this group in 1983. And I think one of these, the person on the left, was killed before Romero, all the rest in the same year after him. Um, all of them Salvadoran except the one uh, at the bottom, kind of out of focus picture, was a Franciscan from Italy. Um, and, and if you saw, there was a little link I could click there to show even more martyrs, all the lay people, which many of them didn't get listed in here. So there were some 75,000 people killed in the Civil War, not all of them religious martyrs. Um, but uh, it's quite a list. Uh, 
so seeing all these martyrs makes a scary story. I'm not simply giving a history lesson, but thought it might be interesting that while perhaps almost everyone, everyone who's heard about any of these knows some of the names, they don't know all, and then it sort of fades off into near oblivion. Uh, but it's not oblivion for a certain kind of faithful in El Salvador, what was called and is still called the Church of the Poor. It's also not oblivion for many of the majority of visitors to El Salvador each year. But people don't simply go to El Salvador to visit the graves of the martyrs, although they do that. In fact, many who go have never heard of anyone except Romero. So why do they go? Well, the answer I'm going to offer tonight is one I take from Jesuit theologian John Sabrino, and that is faith. First, a word about John Sabrino. He was young enough as a Jesuit that while assigned to the community in El Salvador, I think starting in 1957 when he was 19 years old, he attended St. Louis University, a Jesuit university in the U.S., and earned a master's in engineering mechanics. Um, people were thinking about being practical in those days and not just doing theologian. But fairly shortly after, he went to Frankfurt on Main and got his Ph.D. in theology, after which he returned to El Salvador and started making a name for himself writing theology, liberation Christology, to be exact. Sobrino survived the murder of his fellow Jesuits in 1989 only because he was giving a talk in Thailand at a theological conference. The assassins, the troops, were looking for him, that they were looking for him is clear, by the fact that the soldiers who killed his Jesuit confreres machine-gunned Sobrino's bookshelf so they know which, knew which room was his. And as they dragged the bloody bodies of the Jesuits out to the lawn behind, a bullet-riddled book from the shelf fell open face down in the blood of Father Armando Lopez. That book, by some coincidence, or more than coincidence, was The Crucified God by Jürgen Moltmann. It, I thought I had a picture of it, and I, maybe it didn't turn out from the glare of the glass case it was in, but I couldn't find it for uh, whatever reason. Sobrino wrote an essay in 1982, shortly after Romero had been killed, but well before his fellow Jesuits died in 1989, called Bearing with One Another in Faith, a theological analysis of Christian solidarity. And he says that bearing with one another in faith is a theme in St. Paul. Those exact words, actually bearing with one another in love, used in Ephesians, but that whole bearing with or supporting one another, it's a clear as a very uh, constant theme in the writings of St. Paul. This article seems to me absolutely prescient from 1982. It could have been written in 1989 where his co when his colleagues were killed, in 1992 when St. Claudia area first started going to El Salvador, or today. Uh, one of the things Sabrino suggests early in this article is that El Salvador's greatest export is faith. It should have the largest pie slice on its GNP chart. He observes first that the traditional mission conception of church designates a sending church and a receiving church, usually conceived as separate churches. At first glance, he says, the visitors from the United States and Canada, North Americans, and Western Europe, who began coming to El Salvador in the early 1980s, brought material goods to poor communities, especially provisional communities in the refugee camps that were forming during the Civil War. Um, skipping over a little bit here. Uh, Sabrino says the reality of the church relations uh, were actually very different. Christian solidarity, as he experienced it being practiced in El Salvador, he says had three key characteristics. One, and I'm quoting Sabrino here. I was joking with someone that actually I'm merely the editor of this presentation. John Sabrino wrote it, and I had to kind of cut it down a little bit. Uh, solidar and then I set some photos to it. Solidarity has been set in motion when some churches, he says, help another church that is in need because it has taken up solidarity with the poor and oppressed among its own people. Second, the helping churches find out that they not only give but also receive, so those roles get blended from the church that they aid. And what they receive is, is a different and a higher order than often the material aid they provide. They usually describe it as a new inspiration in faith and help in discovering their identities 
in the human, ecclesial, and Christian terms and in relationship to God. And third, through mutual giving and receiving, these churches establish a relationship and they discover that in principle, it is essential that a local church be united to another church and that this embraces all levels of life from the material to faith in God. So Sabrino says in this article that there really have been three basic models of talking about the universal church, a common conception in Christianity. What is the universal church? And he said the first and most dominant one in our history has been the uniformity model. It's one church, it should be uniform. And uh, he says then there, during, in the aftermath of Vatican II or during Vatican II, there came up a pluriformity model, which he says was in some ways better, um, but it lacked a connection to what he calls the truth of the poor and it also, it didn't have a real strong basis for establishing relations between the church. Each church could express its, the faith in its own way, but there was no real ground for connections between them. And the third model he calls the solidarity model. And he says this is the model that was sort of discovered partly by accident, but partly because it just started working in El Salvador, uh, especially in the early 1980s when he was writing this and since then. I'm going to show you a number of slides now, and I'm going to go through, through them very quickly, um, not commenting on each one, that I think depict some kind of solidarity. My experiences in our sister city of Tenancingo and some other places with various groups over a number of years, including a couple of student groups. Some of you who have been around for a while may recognize some of the students. Others will just recognize them as students. The f oh, this is uh, actually Sabrino. I should have had that up there before. And this is Sabrino at the... Um, School of the Americas protest. And the custom is to use these crosses. That's his colleague, uh, Confer Ignacio Eucurillo, was the leader of the Jesuits who was killed in 1989. And people carry these crosses, and when they call out the names, they say, all of them say, presente, meaning they're still alive, they're still present here with us. But this, this first of my solidarity slides, then, is a group of people leaving on buses the refugee camps in Honduras to come back to El Salvador while the war is still going on in 1986. And I, in fact, know the gentleman uh, in the hoodie there. He actually is a Salvadoran but lives in San Francisco. And he's, in fact, the, um, the uh, leader of the Share Foundation, of, whose board I was on for a good number of years. Um, this is recognizable. The Vice President for Student Development from St. Ben's in that one. I don't know how I got in those pictures. I must not have been taking them. <laughs> Sister Ann Mallard started things. Two teachers, Salvador and American. Sister Renee Domeyer there. This is a group of St. John's St. Ben students. Current St. John student. And a high school classmate of his, and I forget her name. What you can see in all of these photos is people who come from pretty clearly two different cultural, racial, historical, and sociopolitical realities connecting with one another. John Sabrino identifies a crucial factor in the Salvadoran dynamic of Christian solidarity that makes faith flourish and even become reanimated where it was atrophied. And he calls this the truth of the poor the unveiling of the fact of misery, oppression, and injustice in which millions of human beings live. That's a quotation. For Sabrino, for reasons that stretch from Exodus to Matthew 25 at least, the unveiling of the reality of the poor, the truth of the poor, is part and parcel of Christian revelation. The truth of the poor grows faith because it simply is the gospel. So the truth of the poor is intimately related to the fact that the Church of El Salvador is a church of martyrs, of heroes who denounce the oppression of the poor and witness to the truth of the poor with their blood at the cost of their lives. Sabrino writes, for many Christians, the persecution of the church has been decisive in their discovery of the truth of the poor. If even the church is repressed and its priests and religious are murdered, then it becomes quite credible that such is also the lot of the poor. What is worse and more tragic, the anonymous poor will be repressed with even fewer scruples and misgivings than are shown towards the church. 
and the implications, the real world results of this revelation, I'll simply quote Sabrino again because I cannot phrase it better. The truth of the poor was communicated in a way that went beyond dispassionate narration, he writes. It managed to reach levels of feeling. The truth of the poor was not only made known, it unleashed indignation and protest. Finally, because it is the church that is persecuted and communicates the oppression and repression of the people through its own persecution, this truth is automatically presented as an ethical demand on others. The truth of the poor, thus unveiled, requires a response not only with a theoretical judgment, but with a practical judgment that sets in motion some form of concrete action. So I'm going to turn now to a separate slideshow, one that has a song embedded in it, because it captures so well what the Church of the Poor teaches Christians coming from a comfortable, unoppressed church. And this should. Now, this group is what you heard before is a Venezuelan group called Los Guarawao. I don't know what the name actually means. It might be a place name. And it's going to be parallel column translated for you. Cristo al servicio de quien preguntaba ay mi obrero preguntaba ay mi obrero al servicio de unos pocos que se lo llevaron preso disfrazándolo con lujos sabiendo que él es del pueblo lo tienen encarcelado en palacios de concreto con pisos de puro mármol, de pura madera el techo, templos que no se parecen a las casas de mi pueblo, casas de lata y cartón, techos rotos, tierra al suelo. Cristo al servicio de quien preguntaba, ay mi obrero, preguntaba, ay mi obrero. A Cristo hay que liberarlo, él siempre quiso ser pueblo y hoy lo explotan los de arriba, ricos iglesia y gobierno, los señores de una iglesia que está muy lejos del pueblo, que no sabe de miserias, que no vive su evangelio y que no habla nuestro idioma. Cuando nos dice silencio, son cosas que Dios permite, son cosas que manda el cielo. Cristo al servicio de quien preguntaba, ay mi obrero, preguntaba, ay mi obrero. A Cristo hay que liberarlo, me decía, ay mi obrero, porque ellos se lo han robado. Y Cristo, Cristo es del pueblo, iglesia que no denuncia la injusticia y la opresión. Es una iglesia vendida, queremos resurrección, queremos renovación, queremos revolución. Cristo al servicio de quién? The uh, last three before the final question again, uh, from resurrection to renewal to revolution, is a good sign of it. This is, while it's criticizing the church, it's also a very religious song. And it's a Venezuelan group, but they are hugely popular in El Salvador, especially among the solidarity people. So let me go back to my other slideshow um, and go on here. Now, what this song says, and while the Salvadoran church fell in love with the music of the group, uh, is really the same as Sobrino's message about the experience of pilgrims who come to El Salvador and go back home with a renewed and reawakened faith. But it's a transformed faith. The image that's on screen now is the wooden, brightly painted tabernacle in the Blessed Sacrament Chapel at the Jesuit University, at the Romero Chapel, actually, where now they built it before they were killed to, to Romero, and now their bodies are buried there as well, um, by the Salvadoran artist Fernando Yort, and I'll have something to say about him later. He taught uh, studios of Campesino, and especially Campesina women artisans, to paint these simple motifs, and there's a lot of this wooden, brightly colored, painted uh, thing, especially crosses around the craft shops of El Salvador. Um, now this 
tabernacle is a house. It houses the body of Christ. It houses God's presence, Christ's presence. But notice the houses painted on the side. Though are like, they are like the houses of the poor, not like the house of God with the, made out of pure marble. Um, even though they have uh, red tile roofs that you can't see if they're broken or not, but they do have adobe walls and most likely dirt floors. Now near the end of his essay, Sabrina quotes an English Catholic visitor to El Salvador in the early 1980s. This English Catholic says, I'm a Catholic, I teach a religion class, and yet I find atheistic humanism attractive. But then when I hear what Christians in El Salvador are doing, I recall the witness, and I recall the witness of Archbishop Romero, without exactly knowing why, I really feel like a Christian. My darkened faith becomes real again. And I think that that dynamic became, for me, writ large with the other, and, and the Jesuits hadn't been murdered yet again, and a lot of the others. This has really been my experience since I first traveled to El Salvador in 1998. I went back twice in 99, twice again in 2000. Uh, the first time in 2000 when I went with St. John St. Ben's students, 2001, two, three, uh, twice in each of those years, at least three times one of them. And I haven't been back since 2010, so I sort of feel in a little withdrawal. Um, I've got a good friend who has now gone to El Salvador four times, uh, the first three times with me. And he asked me if he could come in 2000. Um, and then in 2005, with a St. John St. Ben's group, in 2005, he asked if he could bring some of his students from Creighton Durham Hall High School down. And they eventually started their own program. And I accompanied one of those delegations. Um, and it was only, though, a few years ago that he told me that he really got interested in El Salvador because he saw how positively the experience affected me, transformed me, including transforming how I expressed my faith. I told him I didn't know I was such a schmuck before I went to El Salvador, but he apparently liked the change. Now, since Sabrina has helped us unite the theme of the martyrs that I started with, the persecuted church, united that to the truth of the poor, um, as the kind of secret of solidarity for growing faith, I'd like to return to the story of some of these martyrs in a way that shares this faith uh, in solidarity. This chapel is the chapel of Divina Providencia where Archbishop Romero was assassinated. They retell this story every year, and this has been transformed. It's almost a, it is a tourist attraction somewhat now. It's on the property of a cancer hospital where he lived because his archbishop residence was uh, damaged by an earthquake. Uh, he wasn't killed in the cathedral like the movie says. Uh, this is the interior, and from the vantage point of the front door where the Jeep was parked outside that door where the marksman shot him with a scoped rifle, high-powered uh, hollow-point bullet, uh, he had just finished his homily in which he preached on a le unless a grain of uh, corn, sorry, they do corn, not wheat, falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. And then he came to the altar to start the offertory and opened his hands and was shot with a hollow point bullet right in the heart. Um, and so the doors were all open because it, March is, March and April are as hot as it gets down there. And so everything was open. Um, this is a group of St. John St. Ben students in uh, 2001 listening to Madre Rosa, who died I think the next year, uh, tell the story of uh, uh, the assassination of Romero. And the little black thing sitting on the pew top uh, in front of Amy and John is my little ca mini cassette recorder. And about 15 seconds after I took this picture, a 7.6 earthquake struck El Salvador, and our agenda was changed. Um, we didn't even run out of the building, uh, as you're supposed to do in an earthquake, because we're all Midwestern, as we treated it like a tornado and just kind of sheltered in place. Um, this is, again, the altar, a side view of where he was shot. And you can see this plaque. And I'm going to show you a close-up of that plaque. And you can't read it, but you can see on the right-hand side, third line from the bottom, there's a word missing. And I noticed that. And I asked Sister Rosa the year before. This is, uh, that was, group was 2001. The first time I, this is 1998. I said, what is that word? It says on the seventh anniversary to Monsignor Oscar Arnulfo Romero, et cetera, on the seventh anniversary of his blank. And I said, this, it's too long to be muerte, death. And it's too short to be assassination, assassinato. And uh, what she told me is, well, the word is martirio, martyrdom. And I said, well, why, did you, why is it covered over? Why is it erased? And she said, well, someone complained, and they sent someone from Rome. And they told us that only Rome can declare a martyr. 
So I came back the next year with a group in 1999, going to show them this plaque, and there's the word martyr. So I asked Sister Rosa, what happened? Did Rome change its mind? And she shook her head. She says, no, but all the people who come every year, every day, they scratch a little bit away. And what can we do about that? And you can see, actually, there's a little bit of uh, smudging around the edges of it, OK? And so we leave the chapel. And we go across through this gate to the house where he lived. They gave him a little house to live in, which is now a museum, with the bloody vestments that he was wearing. when he, they, they like reality in their uh, sort of testimony to these things. And here's on the, the wall of the house they put this. And this was in 1998, when they had the other word covered. And I said, Sister Rosa, how can you call him a prophet and martyr here, and you couldn't do it in the church? And she said, well, we didn't invite the guy from Rome to come here. Uh, <laughs> So they just let the gate close. So, and you can't read the small writing. It says, los pobres te llaman. The people call you, the poor call you prophet and martyr. Sin prevenir el juicio de la iglesia. Without preventing the judgment of the church. And preventing in Spanish has the sense that it had once upon a time in English in the 16th century or so, that you both, uh, it didn't primarily mean block. It simply meant anticipate. So without, without uh, jumping ahead of the judgment of the church, the poor already call you this. This is the actual tomb of Archbishop Romero in 1998, the first time pilgrims could get there. It was the cathedral had been damaged in yet another earthquake in 1986. So 12 years later was the first time our visiting groups could get there. It had been visited by John Paul II in 96, so two years earlier. And I'll see a mural that was done on the outside of it. We'll see it just a little bit. And so Judy is telling us about that. Judy was the leader the first time I went there. She looks Salvadoran, but she's actually half Puerto Rican. She's lived in St. Cloud, um, and she was one of the leaders of the group and translators. This is what the tomb of Romero looks like today compared to this. Um, bronze, big cast monument. Uh, Obama in 2011 is visiting with the current archbishop about who I'll have some more not nice things to say pretty soon. Um, and the president of El Salvador, Mauricio Funes. Um, and what I wonder, if you think back to that song, which is the Romero, the real Romero, that one or this one? And while I can see this really shows honor and it gets decorated with flowers on his anniversary, I kind of, you know, they're heaped all on top and posters and placards. Um, so it's still used, but I kind of, this is the real Romero. Um, and that monument doesn't quite seem to me to, to cut it. Now this mural has been done since, and it's on the entrance to that hospital grounds. And it's kind of classic, with Romero in the middle kind of mimicking with the child on his lap. This one, um, I think deliberately. And the people on the left with the corn stalks, always a symbol of El Salvador. And the people there, the tree of life, which is a cross, but it's sprouting, coming back to life, kind of a Benedictine theme. And then on the right-hand side, they're, they're sort of peeling back this curtain. And we have these military people, a political guy, always a politician if they're wearing a tie. Um, and notice the people's arms and hands are open on the left side and the right. They're blocking their ears, covering their eyes. The woman with the, uh, the, the uh, big earring is always a sign of the oligarchy and the rich in these kinds of paintings. And what I'm just saying is they remember the martyrs and they paint them on their buildings. And you can't go through El Salvador without being constantly reminded of Romero and the other martyrs. So the structures of social justice are what have given a slow death to our poor, is a quotation of Romero. Romero and the other, one of the other priests, Rafael Palacios in Suchitoto, um, that woman's painted seems to be leaning on the guy's shoulder. Um, they had, this is actually a quotation that Romero said about Rutilio Grande when they killed him when Romero was alive, and now they use it about Romero. They wanted to kill them. They had wanted to kill them, but they are more present now than before in the people themselves. In the first uh, anniversary, the 20th anniversary they went to in 2000, we visited a church that had a couple banners. I just am going to show this one. The authority of the church is service. So his words are put up on banners and on posters and everything all over the country. Romero is preaching to the people of El Salvador as much today as he was in 1977 to 1980, and preaching to the pilgrims that come. I don't have a translation of this. I can do it. Faith is not only, does not only consist in believing with the head, but in offering oneself up with the heart and with one's life, which Romero obviously did. This is in 2000 at the, uh, funeral ma or the uh, memorial mass for Archbishop Romero. And so the altar is set in front of this big screen. 
and people are uh, um, assembled in front of it. And this goes for uh, quite a ways on either side of this. I climbed up on a place where I could get a vantage point. And this is, the, after the mass is over, it becomes a march to the cathedral. And uh, those are St. John, St. Ben's students, Chuck Behrens with all the hair there, and Mara Sullivan, um, Joe Steingraber just behind them with half his head showing. Um, and it's chanting and singing the, the little, uh, I guess we'd call them luminaria with the candles inside of paper bags on posts. Um, this is a mural of Rutilio Grande from El Paisnal, where he was killed, um, as depicted in, fairly close to what was depicted in the film. It's clear, though, that he was shot in the back. It wasn't just, they didn't just wreck the car, as is shown in the movie. Um, they were shot uh, from behind as they traveled. Um, his form there is both embracing and cruciform. So it unifies that suffering and then the positive theology of embracing the poor, who, is, who he's gathering in. Um, and here are the two of them, friends, together on a mural. Um, and they don't write Padre Rutilio's whole name. It's Padre Tilo, which is what everybody would have called him. Padre Tilo and Monsignor Romero, prophets of liberation, with symbols of El Salvador, the corn, the huge corn, balloons, because they celebrate these people, even though they were martyrs. So it's not lugubrious. And uh, even though they like to look at photos of the bloody bodies, just to reaffirm that this really happened. Um, I can't look at that stuff the way the Salvadorans can. And then that sunflower. Here we have the women religious martyrs painted on a uh, building, probably someone's house, um, in Perkin, a long way from where they worked and a long way from where they were killed. There's a museum to the war near this place, but not right here. And it says the martyrs of El Salvador. They are not dead. And the Salvadorans, especially the solidarity groups, like to use this at sign because it's both an O and an A, and therefore it's inclusive of both genders. Um, so they are not muertos muertas. Um, those who in sweet peace rest under the cold tomb, dead are those who have death in their soul and are still alive. This is a group of primarily women religious from the United States, but also some others. Obviously, the men in the picture are not religious women. Um, I know a few of the people in this group, and they, they are organized by the Share Foundation. Every year on December 2nd takes a group of, uh, pr they primarily invite women religious from the U.S. to go down and commemorate the women martyrs. This is a, a wall in uh, the Central Park, Parque Cuscatlan in San Salvador, and it's kind of like the Vietnam Memorial, very much inspired by that. And uh, this is the group from Share finding names of people, sometimes people not just the famous ones, but people from their sister communities. And in fact, we've gone here with people from our sister city who don't often get to go here. And so we just rent a bus and bring them um, and then visit it with them. Um, this is the Rose Garden at the Jesuit University. It's a pilgrimage spot. This was simply a lawn where the bodies of the Jesuits were dragged and discovered in the early morning of November 17th, I think. Um, I think they say they were killed on the 16th and they found them the 17th. Um, the rose garden was actually planted by the gardener who was the husband of Elba and the father of uh, Selena. Um, this is a group of people, both Americans and some from St. Cloud. Um, if Carla Durand were here, she'd see the back of her head there, about the fourth back of the head from the left. Um, and. Uh, uh, people from Kansas City also with us, but also Salvadorans from our sister city seeing this stuff. And here in the Rose Garden, this is not where they're buried, but their names are carved there and the 16th of November, 1989. And then Elba and Selena have their own where their bodies were discovered because they were in the room. Um, and there, there's obviously much more. The museum that they have shows uh, quite a bit of things, uh, including those books I said that were machine gunned. Now this is the cathedral with the mosaic on the front. And this was in 1998, because I can tell from the, all that's all St. Cloud people, Sister Renee Domeyer on the far, on the right-hand side there. Um, and they had not been able to get in here, as I said before that. Now this plaza, and the trees wouldn't have been as big, was full of people when Romero was, the funeral was going on. They couldn't all fit in. And off to the left-hand side of that plaza is the uh, uh, treasury building. And on the roof of that were uh, military, and they actually opened fire over the heads of people to disperse them, because it was Palm Sunday. It was a huge event. And uh, they just wanted to get them out of there. And people died as they were trampled, um, trying to leave. They thought they were just going to machine gun everybody. 
This is a close-up of that same mural. And here's where I'm getting to today. Um, well, almost today. In uh, late 2000, December 2011, this uh, drapery went up in front of the cathedral. And people wondered what was going to happen. Well, this is what happened. There's the mural being discarded into a big uh, dumpster bin by a worker. Here is Fernando Yort's mural, which is entitled The Harmony of La Armonia de Bin Pueblo, The Harmony of My People. Uh, it was done when the cathedral was being rededicated after the earthquake and Romero being buried there, and it became a pilgrimage site there. And I have to say that after that, the cathedral reopened in 1998 um, and 2000 then when I came back, it was becoming his grave. They'd start having masses there. And between 2000 and 2005, the archbishop then, uh, Fernando Sainz, uh, Fernand Sainz Lacay, uh, tried to ban those masses. He said the masses should go on upstairs. He tried to do that, and they just became bigger. The more he tried to ban them, the bigger they became. It's not the same person who did this, but because Romero, in some ways, was bigger than the present archbishops of El Salvador. Saints Lacaye was a, a, an Opus Dei person who's a very, very different temperament than Romero. Um, and now this is what it looks like. Quite a difference. So uh, part of what I'm uh, worried about is, is the uh, uh, church in El Salvador maintaining its commitment. What's happened to the prophetic church? I'll say something a little more. That was 2011, finished destroying it in early 2012. So just two years ago. This is uh, on the way back from El Mosote. We had visited, and I'll show you El Mosote in just a second. We had visited there, and I said, geez, it's too bad I read Mark Danner's book. We all read it was in 2001 with the St. John, St. Ben's group. That's actually a, a girl from Chicago, uh, Rosa Diaz, who was parents are Mexican, so she was translating for us. And the woman she's talking to is Rufina Amaya, the sole survivor, as far as we know, of uh, El Mosote, massacre in which 1,000 people were killed in December 1981. Um, and uh, somebody interviewed her fairly shortly after that, how she escaped. And uh, it was published in the... Uh, uh, New Yorker magazine and the Philadelphia newspaper, and people said, this is made up. It can't be true. Um, people tried to investigate it, and they turned back because it was too dangerous. Um, and I, I was sad that she wasn't living. I could see why she wouldn't want to live in El Mosote. Um, everyone she knew was killed. Um, and, uh, and the story of how she escaped is rather miraculous, but it'd take a little too long to tell. Um, but... Uh, I just said to our driver, whose name was Romeo, not Romero, but Romeo, like Romeo, uh, and his two oldest children are Romeo and Julieta. Um, but uh, so he's a, he's a tough Salvadoran guy with a, with a soft heart. Um, he says, oh, you want to talk to Doña Rufina? Well, she lives right over here. And he just pulled over on the side of the road and disappeared into the bushes and came back with her. And so she came and talked with us. This is our CSB SJU group with them. Um, Amy, where's Amy uh, with the gray kind of tank top, uh, third or fourth, I guess, from the left-hand side. Ask Doña Rufina, says, Doña Rufina, what would you tell us? We're Americans. We've come all the way here for a brief visit. And we're going to go home. What would you give us as a message to take back? And Doña Rufina said, we only have each other. That was her message for them. So it's kind of a fortuitous to say, oh, you know, talk to her. Now, Doña Rufina told this story, and people thought the official word was that she was crazy. And this was especially the official word. This happened in 1981, the official word of the Reagan administration from 1981 until 1988, and the official word of the first Bush administration as well. Um, the ambassador who had been appointed by Carter in 1980 actually visited the grave sites where they were exhuming the bodies of the church women, but he was replaced because he was too sympathetic, and the ambassadors after that followed orders. This is the monument at El Mosote with all the names of the people who were killed. It includes the name of Rufina's family, her husband, Domingo Claro Sorayana, um, her husband says, her and her children, Jose Cristino Claros, nine years old, Dolores Claro Samaya, five years old, Maria Lillian Claro Samaya, two years old, 
and uh, Maria Isabel Claro Samaya, eight months old. She claims that of the slightly older children, that she could recognize their voices as they were um, being killed. The children were not taken outside the church. They were all gathered in the church. They were killed in the church with machetes, uh, mainly. Um, as were the, they, they killed people with machetes so they wouldn't hear the gunshots. And there was a disturbance, and she fell to her knees, and the line kept going forward, and then she snuck into this weed patch, she says, and escaped. And that's what people say, oh, that could never have happened. This is Maria Julia Hernandez. She was, she's deceased now. She was the head of the Tutela Legal, the legal aid office, human rights office of the Archdiocese of El Salvador. And she was a friend of Archbishop Romero. She actually, this formally started after Romero, but there had been a predecessor to it. And she actually led a campaign after the war was over to go back to El Mosote and to try to find out what really happened there because the Salvadoran situation had changed and the UN was there doing investigations. And, that's, and she's in fact looking at the remains when they had a burial of remains. And the Share Foundation that I worked for helped her find a team of forensic pathologists, uh, anthropologists from uh, Argentina who had their own experience of this kind of nasty business in Argentina to come and do an exhumation. And they, the church had been burned by coincidence um, and rebuilt, but they went to where the old one was and look what they found in the sacristy. All children's skeletons. So this is the suffering is palpable and you don't see this, but you see the pictures of it. Pilgrims experienced that. This year in October, it was declared September 30th of 2013, and then it happened the next day. Uh, the Archbishop closed the Human Rights Office, put padlocks on the doors. He said there's been corruption going on here. There's been no evidence presented of corruption. This is a group of people protesting, and so when they protest, they carry their heroes with them on placards to protest. Um, still nothing has happened in the October, November, December, three plus months since then. Uh, people are asking, what they're asking for is, where are the archives? All the people that gave their testimony about what happened to them during the war are in the files in there. And you know, one of the, maybe it was Colorado State was trying to help them uh, preserve those. I had actually mentioned to Father Columba the possibility of giving them some advice about digitizing them. Okay. Um, I'm going to end by talking again about solidarity. This is our group from St. Cloud with one of our people from our sister city who had come to the uh, capital and we had a nice meeting and talked about how we could interact with each other. So we're doing the sharing that Sabrino talked about. What Sabrino talks about as solidarity is bearing with one another in faith. He says the faith of others is important for one's own faith. In the de facto course of events, it is essential, as has clearly been shown in Latin America. And this is a group of Salvadorans in Minnesota, actually at the Resource Center of the Americas in Minneapolis. And they came up to visit in 2001. And that's uh, Roseanne Fisher, who was previously the head of the mission office in St. Cloud. He continues, insofar as is the faith of the other, it always challenges one's own faith and questions whether one's commitment is enough or whether important aspects of commitment to God have been left out. But insofar as it is the faith of the other, it is an embodiment of the miracle of faith. It is something enabling and encouraging for one's own faith. And so that's where I'm going to end by saying that this is sort of the miracle that what looks like tragedy turns into something that makes, at least in my experience and the experience of many, faith kind of reflower. So with this, I'll be willing to to take some questions, I think Abbot John will uh, turn on some of the microphones. Uh, oh, they're on, OK. Um, does anybody have any questions for me? Is there? At this time, Dennis, is there a process for canonization for Oscar Romero the and process, the other martyrs? The, the process for uh, canonization is going forward. And in fact, under Pope Francis, um, 
it's been given a, a green light, but it was going forward before. I mentioned that they couldn't use the word martyr, uh, and Pope John Paul II was there in 1996. He went back in 2002. Well, he was in Guatemala in 2002 for another uh, beatification, I think. Um, and he, in his homily, he called Romero a martyr. He did not do that by accident. So uh, he, in fact, felt bad and said he felt bad. He had one of the papal uh, um, nuncio, or not, yeah, the papal nuncio had told him that Romero was simply a communist. So Romero's last ad limina visit in 1979 before he was assassinated, uh, John Paul II was very down on him and kind of snubbed him. Um, and he has admitted in some interview or so that he felt bad after that, after Romero was assassinated, that he shouldn't have listened to that person. Yeah. So this, in fact, the mural that's shown here says, Romero, um, the people have already made you a saint. Please, Hillary. What's the state? Sorry. What, what's going on now? What, what do you do when you go down there now? What's Renee doing when she, when she goes down? Well, um, Renee, you know, Sister Renee hasn't been there since 98. Um, Sister Ann Malarich can't go anymore. The groups that go, the Cretan Durham Hall takes down two groups of people every year. And I think one of the things they do is get people to know the reality, learn some of the history, but talk to people about how they're struggling now. And a lot of the struggles now are economic questions, um, economic policy questions. But also, they'll be lobbying for things like the handing on and the safeguarding of these archives, claiming that these archives belong to the people, do not belong to simply the archdiocese. So there's very much concern that, uh, that this archbishop is start starting to show his stripes. He was appointed in, I think, 2008. Um, and, uh, but what people do is uh, visit the peoples, try to build some relationships, a lot of emphasis on youth connections, but try to find out, one of, say, the immigration and the push that young people see no future there and think about leaving to try to get to the United States is one of the things they talk about. Um, and so it's in some ways trying to keep this alive. There are some ways in which it's got a little bit more a, a secular side to this as well. Um, but the big events every year are the anniversaries of these martyrs. Um, and they're quite extraordinary. I was there only once for the Jesuit one in November. I'm usually a little busy doing other things about November 16th. Um, but I have been there for the Romero one and twice, uh, and once for the Rutilio Grande one, when it's brutally hot and you're walking in uh, the countryside. Because you walk the same walk that they walked when they were shot. That's what the group does every year. Other questions? Something that I shortened or? Could, could Dennis, could, could you unpack the meaning of the, just, just the key sentence, I think, way back, and it was from Sobrino, and it's, it's the truth of the poor is the gospel. Okay, and actually, that, yeah, that was my gloss on Sobrino, so I can claim credit for that. Okay. But he says that the truth that the poor embody, that there is no gospel without the poor. Uh, Sobrino was actually, there was a warning given about his teachings that was really penned, I was telling Father Rene today, by Cardinal Ratzinger, and then Ratzinger was elected as Pope Benedict, and nothing had been done. He was, we knew, they knew he was investigating Sobrino because Sobrino had to give testimony, etc. And two years after he was elected, Sobrino, there was a warning that came out from Cardinal Levada, um, but it was words, the, the argument against him were words from Pope Benedict's own book on Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, it was claimed that Sobrino was a bad theologian because he talked about Jesus learning what his mission was and coming to know what was required of him, and he thought he was just going to announce the good news, and the cross or, or persecution started looming. Um, and uh, he, he even claims that Jesus really discovered uh, what it meant to be uh, in solidarity with the poor, with the imperial Roman uh, occupation around. And uh, after, uh, there was no punishment given, but Sabrino, the errors were listed. Um, and uh, Sabrino's next book, was a riff on a standard theological line, no salvation outside the church, extra ecclesia nulla salus. And Sabrino's book was extra pauperes nulla salus. Outside the poor, there is no salvation. And that's what he means is 
it's, if it doesn't have the poor at its core, it's not the gospel. That, that's his belief about the gospel. Anything else? To what extent do you see us as being complicit in the situation of the poor in El Salvador? In El Salvador? I, I mean, I think for me it was quite clear that early in the, at least a portion of people in the 1980s through their civil war, which ended in January 1992, that there certainly was a kind of complicity. But what's really interesting, uh, actually Romero has started this, and then his successor, who was very good. I mean, Romero's successor was supposed to be Romero. Uh, Archbishop Arturo Rivera Damas was the one everybody thought would be elected or not named archbishop. But he was too liberal, and they didn't, the Anuncio didn't want him. So they said, let's take this pious guy who just hangs out in the seminary, Romero, and he'll start kind of pious clubs and, and keep the lid on everything. And uh, he didn't. Uh, and uh, then after he was killed, they had no other choice but to name Rivera Damas, the archbishop. Um, and he, after Romero was killed and what was all those other priests and lay people, et cetera, were killed in 1980 or in those early slides, uh, Riveri Damas just said, I call upon the Christians of North America to be in solidarity with us here. And people did respond. So churches started going there. They started living in communities kind of as a little bit as human shields, but especially in the refugee camps uh, during the 1980s. The going home campaign, Americans went down, Canadians, Europeans, but especially Americans, because of what their government was doing, went down, went to the refugee camps, and then walked back across the borders with the Salvadorans, arm in arm. Uh, so to answer Dale is there's complicity, but I think what Romero's talking about is those who are in solidarity, they're on the other side of complicity. They're in complicity with the first point that he made and the ones I listed off, and they're his points, is that the church that comes to visit aligns itself with the church that has already embraced its poor as its core mission. And uh, I would say that is a way that, uh, that we can sort of have a, a solidarity complicity rather than a, uh, a complicity of sort of believing in government uh, propaganda. But part of what we believe is, say, the necessi necessity of uh, free trade movements instead of fair trade movements. And so all the contracts we have with Central America, which actually make it impossible for them to afford to buy their own corn. They, it's cheaper sometimes for them to buy corn from North Dakota than to buy corn from, and beans from North Dakota, than to buy their own beans because they're mass produced by huge farms. And those are all, they're, they're also very subsidized. If they had subsidies, it would be a violation of the free trade agreement. But American farmers have subsidies. Not that I want to hit on American farmers, but there's, there are some inequities there. Rice from Texas is cheaper than rice grown in El Salvador. Doesn't make a whole lot of, or, a whole lot of sense. So in those economic terms, there's still some complicity. I, I did a point and looked at some of my cotton t-shirts and underwear, et cetera, to see how many of them are made in Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala. Um, and we want to get things as cheap as we can um, and sometimes don't ask about how they're made. Um. I don't mean to seem like I'm hung up on the wrong thing, but the destruction of the mural around mm -hmm. that cathedral was one of the biggest like new pieces of information is there anything going on that's, that could be called an effort to sort of put that back or nearby something like it? Yeah, there is, there is an effort. They have a, um, a, a Facebook page called Indignados por el Mural, uh, People Indignant at the Mural. Um, and there's also, there is a Fernando Yort uh, Foundation um, that is doing things. I want to get one of the t-shirts that I didn't know they existed that simply have the mural on a t-shirt and have a, um, a, a statement about it. Um, 
because he really is identified. They asked him, I have pictures. Uh, he painted the triptych of two big panels and a cross in the middle commemorating Romero in the Jesuit chapel. The Jesuit said, we want you to do this. And so his art is associated with this popular church movement throughout the 1980s and 1990s into now. And so there is a movement behind that. I don't know how big it is, et cetera, um, but it is there. And that's about two years now that that has, uh, has been there. The claim was that it was falling, parts of it were falling down. He claims it was covered with glass, <laughs> with glaze. Really? The way you speak of the present archbishop would make me think that perhaps there's a great rift in the church there itself. Uh, otherwise, he's very isolated, or else the people are very isolated, which I would think would lead to a very difficult ecclesial climate. I'm guessing that's true. I don't know it for sure. My, the, one of the troubles I have is when I go there, all the people I hang out with are left-wingers and uh, liberation theology people and the Church of the Poor. Um, the, uh, the, and, but the official pastors, too, in those churches are, are regular priests. The priest they had in Tenancingo, who is now down in Soyopongo, a much more working-class area, in the metropolitan urban area uh, is a great guy. Um, and uh, so there is, a, a, there is that dynamic in the church. I think they knew, I think they thought they were getting a more moderate person with this, so he's starting to show his stripes now. There's clearly a rift between him and the Jesuits, though. And his predecessor actually tried to impose a penalty on Sobrino, even though the Vatican had refused to. Um, now, Sobrino was 75. He would just as soon not have to keep giving classes. Um, but he can speak publicly. Um, but uh, I think there is the possibility of that. One of my difficulties, even, even though I can read Spanish, is when Dean Brackley, who, when the Jesuits were killed, there were something like 200 Jesuits from all over the world that volunteered to take their place. And one of them was Dean Brackley from the Bronx. So he spoke Spanish with this wonderful Bronx accent, um, which I can't imitate. Um, but uh, he was a great guy, and he died of cancer a couple of years ago. But he must have been the one that translated their weekly letter to the churches into English and posted it on their website, because it hasn't been posted since he got really sick. Um, and that was my way of keeping up. Every January, they would do the state of the church in El Salvador, and I haven't been able to keep up with it. Let's uh, put our hands together for a wonderful presentation by the analysts.